Hello and welcome to episode 25 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. <laughs> welcome back, chaps. So today, I've got a question for you. What would you tell yourselves as noobs? So if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your younger, less experienced counterparts about Linux and FOSS? Run. <laughs> <laughs> so are we talking young people now, or are we talking young people 20 years ago? Well, you weren't young 20 years ago. You were a baby 20 years ago. So when you were young. I was thinking about this, and for me, I think it's, not to be scared of programming. So for quite a number of years, I'm very bad at maths. And I just assumed that I would not be able to find any kind of programming language accessible at all. And I don't think that's true. And I kind of regret that I don't have more of a foundation in some programming languages. Now my job, we're kind of like forensic scientists. It's not so important for us that we're able to code. I liken it to how I cook. My wife is a very spontaneous cook. I'm not. I need a recipe book and I need the recipes. But if I have it, at the end, I can get something quite good. So you couldn't sit me down in front of like a blank code editor and say, pick a language and write a program that tries to achieve this. But I can piece something together. And the troubleshooting that I'm doing in my job now has made me realize that it's not as scary as all that. And actually quite a lot of the time it's more logic based than numerical. So I think I would go back and say, stop being scared of it and just have a bit more of a go because I think I would be further along with some of those things now than I am. I'm not sure about programming because for me, I did do a bit of basic programming and I mean basic. What does that stand for? Beginners something? Beginners ASIC. Yeah, beginner's ASIC, 10, print, hello, 20, go to 10, run, and all that when I was a, a little kid. And I got to four and next loops and just decided this is not for me. I'm not clever enough for this. So that's not my regret, but it's kind of similar, I suppose. For me, it's I wish I'd spent less time on the desktop and trying all different desktop environments and distros and everything and just settled on Zubuntu much more quickly and then explored headless servers, generally command line stuff, cloud, serverless, like we talked about a couple of episodes ago. I wish I'd explored that stuff a lot sooner and spent a lot less time bogged down on the desktop. I'm not sure if that's fair, because on one hand, I would say to myself, do more programming. It's not scary. There's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with you if you want to do it. Programmers aren't bad people. Okay, maybe they are. But what I ended up doing first was going through some Cisco classes because I thought I was going to be a network engineer. And what that ultimately led to was I knew a lot more about programming networked applications than most people do. And being able to know, say, how to open up Wireshark to troubleshoot your application is just mind blown to so many people. So I guess what I'm trying to say is just because you have experience in different things and you didn't get as much in what you're doing now, that all still applies. What you said has just struck a chord with me because I didn't do anything Cisco, but my way in, I think, if I go back far enough, was a lot of networking stuff. And it continues to be incredibly useful now, knowing the underlying network infrastructure that's happening and the technologies which do play in. So I guess it, the path might seem unorthodox, but it does inform. But I do just with sometimes I could look at a Python script, for example, and not have to think as hard as I do to understand what's going on. I have some bad news for you. It doesn't matter how much programming knowledge you have, <laughs> you will still have to do that. Now I don't feel quite as bad that literally every time I need to write some code, I end up Googling it and let your stack exchange. <laughs> so does everyone else. I have some friends who are quite experienced programmers and, and what they often say is it's, I guess, it isn't so much about being excellent, excellent, because the people that try and pretend that they are that actually end up making lots of mistakes because they're too bloody minded to admit that they don't quite know what they're doing and stop 
and reference stuff. Are you talking about 10x developers? <laughs> I think he may be. <laughs> but um, it's more a case of having an aptitude for piecing things together correctly as well. But I guess because my background into everything is unorthodox as well, I didn't do a computer science degree and I've sort of picked up along the way and landed where I've landed. You do have that kind of voice in the back of your head going, oh, I should have done it a more traditional way, but maybe that's not actually that important. Yeah, I get the same thing as you, Chris. Like my background is not in computer science. My background was in sound engineering. And then I just landed a job as an apprentice IT guy at insurance brokers and everything I've ended up doing has been self-taught. So I suffer quite often from this these huge doses of imposter syndrome where I just think, why don't I know that? Why don't I understand you know, all of these bits and pieces that I hear colleagues talking about? But then sometimes I take a step back and I'm talking to other people and I'm like, oh, I do kind of get this. But for me, I think the thing that I would tell myself you know, as a younger person was don't be so afraid to get involved with the community. Because I was just out here, you know, this this teenager who was playing around with you know, various Linux distros and stuff and trying to teach myself basic system administration. And that was that was all well and good. But it wasn't until I started going to FOSS events. I think it was the first FOSS talk, maybe, was the first thing I went to in person. Oh, wow. And it wasn't until I started going to these FOSS events, I realized that there was a whole world that I was missing out on by just messing around with, like, you know, Nginx on a headless box or installing Ubuntu on my desktop. There was just a whole community of people out there who, you know, over the years I've learned invaluable amounts of information from i've learned huge amounts of interpersonal skill from and i think the tech stuff i probably could have picked up myself and learned a lot without talking to people but actually those kind of interpersonal skills and building relationships with people i think has been more valuable than anything else that i've done to my career it's funny you mention that because that's something i was going to bring up i wish that pre the event i had gone to way more meetups and events even just small things just you know there's a bunch of stuff on meetup.com that's you know maybe five or ten people go to it rather than just going to Og camp once a year and then organizing Foss talk live once a year it would have been nice i think to just go and hang out with like-minded people more often but then maybe i wouldn't be doing this to the extent that i am now because being too lazy to go out and meet people I kind of forced myself to talk to people and record it instead. But I think there's inherent value in both, right? Because there are definitely people who, for whatever reason, won't be able to, won't want to go to those kind of events. So they probably get great value from listening to us you know, have a chat for 20 minutes about stuff. It's getting a little bit meta. <laughs> but for you know everyone else, those events were, were just hugely, hugely important. And you know, I've got people who I've met at those events that have ended up, you know, friends for five plus years. It's it's really crazy to think about that. And the amount of people in the industry I've met who have you know, given me a leg up in jobs and stuff, it's just really been life changing, that side of the community, I think. Do you think maybe that's just entirely a factor of don't be afraid of not knowing things and you know more than you think? Because for a while, the reason why I didn't want to get involved with stuff was just because, oh, they're so much smarter than me. They aren't going to want to talk to me. And that's both professionally and volunteering. Why would they want to help me do the thing that I want to do if I can't help them do the thing they want to do? Which just wasn't how the community was at all. And indeed, that imposter syndrome is something that holds a lot of people back, I think. But if you take a step back and say, this is how much I really know, or even <laughs> start talking to someone and realize they have the same expression on their face that you do when you think you don't know something, <laughs> just being able to see like, you're currently experiencing imposter syndrome, whoa, <laughs> is, well, I mean, it's a big part of being in in-person events and being at offices or just on Zoom calls. That's a fun feeling to have that. The person sitting across from you also thinks they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> There's something else that I tell myself as well, and that is specialize a bit more. Don't just play with every little thing for a brief period. Actually, 
master something, decide something that you want to actually become, maybe not an expert in, but proficient with. And I just haven't done that. There's just nothing really, there's no IT thing that I am proficient with, except for making these shows, which doesn't really count as an IT thing. But again, because you have the generalist angle on things, you're able to do shows from this philosophical one to being the half-admin in two and a half-admins. So you actually have useful questions to ask of Jim and Alan. I think that you're selling yourself short by saying that the generalist thing hurts you in podcasting. Well, it doesn't hurt me. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I just wish that I knew more about one area or two areas. Like most people are generalists in terms of their interest in technology. They're kind of people that travel in our circles anyway and are enthusiasts. But most people have one or two or three or more areas where they have deep knowledge. And I just don't really have that. And just out of personal development stuff, I guess, it'd just be nice to have deep knowledge. Like, you know, I can run a server on a VPS, for example. I can do a few other things as well, but I wouldn't like to teach anyone anything, put it that way. And like I say, it's not about like necessarily my career or anything. It's much more about what I would just like to almost like as a hobby thing, I don't know, a a personal development, personal achievement type thing, if that makes sense. But see, I'm almost the opposite. I'm kind of glad that I'm a bit more of a generalist when it comes to technology and even in cloud, the field I work in, because I think it's more valuable for me in the role that I have doing consultancy to know a little bit about a lot of different aspects of cloud and a lot of different aspects of Linux and system administration in the past than it would be for me to deeply understand MySQL. Because then I'm kind of pigeonholing myself into being a MySQL DBA. And I might be a really, really good MySQL DBA, but I can only really be a MySQL DBA. Whereas I know enough about the kind of different aspects of stuff that I deal with day to day, that I can talk to those things and I can understand them. And I know, you know a little bit more about certain areas than others. And I think that's also fine. And there's something to be said for that. I think it's good to have a broader sense of things because of how quickly things change as well. I've always liked to think that I don't want to go too deeply anywhere because you just don't know how things are going to become passed over over time. And I personally prefer to be ready to jump ever so slightly to a different perspective because something else has come along that's more interesting. And when sometimes I meet people who are incredibly knowledgeable, and like Dalton was saying, like when you see in someone's face, I get surprised sometimes that you have this deeply technical conversation with someone and then something comes up that they have never heard of and have no idea about. And it's really interesting to them because it's something that's come along and sort of, it's just not hit their radar. So that's the way that I always look at it, that I'm a generalist for a lot of stuff. There has been some stuff that I've tried to look at and go, okay, that's where I'm going to need to focus a little bit more in terms of employment opportunities, there is going to be a certain level where I'm going to have to hone it down because I'm, I just need to know that stuff. But generally, I, I prefer, that's why I, the role that I do at the moment, I like because it's kind of a mix of everything and being that forensic detective of someone coming along and saying, you know, it could be an incredibly complex piece of code that I could not understand from top to bottom, but that person is so in the weeds. Like I had this the other day, Someone sent an incredibly complex script in that we were trying to troubleshoot. And literally all that was wrong with it was it was YAML and there was one space out of place. (laughs) It's kind of hilarious, but also it's really important sometimes to be able to take a step back. And and this person, YAML's not everyone's favorite. I understand that. But a lot of stuff's being put together with it now. And I've used it quite a lot because of using stuff like Docker Compose. And then I got taught about using a linter to save time and stuff like that. But it's sometimes quite useful to have someone to just not look at the code and go, well, there's this really like important thing that is not the code that's facilitating the code that you've missed because you're so worried about what's going on there. Yeah, I think you can go too deeply into something. Like the amount of times where, you know, I will in my day job get asked a question by someone 
And the question is really easily answered by just reading the documentation for a given service. <laughs> but they are so deep into the weeds of trying to build whatever it is they're trying to build that they don't think to take a step back. So I think it's really similar to your example, Chris, that sometimes you do need someone who's a bit more of a generalist to help you out with that stuff. There's one other thing that I tell myself, and that is just make the switch sooner. Just make the switch now. Because for a while I was dabbling with running Linux properly and dual booting with Windows and I'd hit a snag and I'd just say, oh, all right, that's it. I'm rebooting back into Windows. Ah, comfortable pair of slippers. I know exactly what I'm doing. Whereas I'd say, no, persist, solve that problem and you'll learn about what you're doing and it'll be valuable. Put up with those problems, learn how to fix them and you're going to have a better time long term. Don't rely on going back to Windows all the time. Yeah, I found it was absolutely the same case, only on the server, which is probably a bit backwards compared to some people. But I was working, I've said before, in quite a big Microsoft environment, lots of Windows servers, IIS, Active Directory, all of that rubbish. And for a while, I just kept trying to run Linux on my home server and going back to Windows because it was this comfortable pair of shoes and I knew IAS better than I did Apache or Nginx and I didn't want to faff about editing config files and all the rest of it. But actually, when I really got into it and I left working in a Windows shop, it was just way easier. And now I don't think I could go back to administering an IAS software ever again. Well, do let us know what you would say to your younger, less experienced self. You can email us, show at linuxafterdark.net. But we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. And I have been Dalton. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs>